This Week in Parasitism is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at microbeworld.org slash twip. This week in Parasitism, episode number 19, recorded November 19th, 2010. Hey everybody, I'm Vincent Racaniello, and I'm with Dixon Despommier. Hey Vince. Hey, it's the 19th episode, and we're recording it on the 19th. Amazing. Amazing. How often do such coincidences occur in the world? Well, you know, when you look for them, I guess they occur more than you think. But uh... It's meaningless, I know. <laughs> but it just struck me as I was saying the words, since we recorded last, your book has been published. It has. And are you enjoying being a famous author? <laughs> Not yet, but I'm enjoying being an author. Yes. <laughs> yeah, no, it's been a lot of fun, actually. Do people come up to you on the street and say, sign my copy? Not on the street, but I was at a book signing last night, and people did. And Excellent. I, was, I enjoyed it. We all love adulation. Well, to a degree. You love it. Uh, well, everybody enjoys being recognized for uh, something that they did that they think is uh, useful. Yeah. How about that? Useful. We're waiting for your next one. <laughs> Let's get through with this one first. <laughs> Are you writing more books? I am. All right. Yep. Keep writing and building vertical farms and uh, right. making the world a better place. Perhaps. Because it's full of parasites, as you it know. Is. It is. It is. It's, and it's loaded with them. We have discussed the protozoa for the last, I don't know how many episodes, many episodes. Right, except for the first couple where we discussed trichinella, which was my research um, That's right. subject. That's right. We moved into the protozoa and right. went through most of the major ones, right? Yeah. Yep. So now, what do we do? We're going to go back to the worms. We're going to do basic worm biology again. Mm -hmm. And this time, we're going to start at the bottom and work our way up. At the bottom? Yes. But you know that parasitologists, they start at the bottom and they work what their way down. What is the bottom down. referring to? The tree, <laughs> the ladder, the... The bottom. Well... <laughs> Your bottom and my bottom. <laughs> Parasitologists start at the bottom and work their way down, so to speak. Mm. That's a bad play on words. We're going back to the worms. So in your book, yes. which is called Parasitic Diseases, Indeed. fifth which is, edition, yes. chapter uh, four were, was the protozoa, yeah. which we talked about. And now chapter five is the nematodes. Yep. And these are the worms we're going to talk about. Indeed. Now we've said something about them in the past. It's in general, in the very beginning episodes. Correct. Yeah. Correct. When right. we did the general characteristics of all of the parasites that are eukaryotes. Mm -hmm. But I think today we should s say something about the ones which actually, um, if we could sanitize the world, Vince, and yes. just keep human fecal contamination out of our local environment, out of our food and water, yes. we could solve a tremendous number of health problems that exist today which are caused by some of these agents that we'll be discussing, and, and some of the protozoans that we discussed as well, like Giardia and Entamoeba histolytica, which are, and, and Cryptosporidium, those organisms are transmitted by water that's been contaminated with feces as well. What about toxo? Nah, that's, uh, that's another way to catch it. That's foodborne. Always, I don't remember. Unless, yeah. Toxo course, is always foodborne. <clears throat> unless, of course, you're an otter living along the west coast of the United States because... There's so much toxo in the effluent going out into the estuaries mm -hmm. from our own effluent, basically, our own fecal contamination and, and animal waste as well, that the otters along the west coast are catching toxoplasmosis and they're dying, which is a very unusual way of catching toxo, but it's possible because the oocyst okay. survives in the environment. So the worms are transmitted... By contaminated water? Well, some are. See, th th we've got to go back to the basics of transmission again because we've got foodborne, waterborne, and if you lump those together and you take foodborne as an issue, mm -hmm. okay, some of these parasites, like the one we discussed to begin with, Trichinella spiralis, is a foodborne infection that has nothing to do with fecal contamination. It has something to do with the infected portion of meat that we eat. Right. Okay. We discussed another one like that that was a tapeworm. That was uh, 
to cyst the psychosis uh, tapeworm right. that we discussed and the adult beef tapeworm and the adult pork tapeworm. The, both of those are transmitted by eating raw or undercooked beef and pork. So now we've got some parasites, which are very basic um, denizens of the human intestinal tract, which I'm going to tell now everybody listening that let's imagine what it's like to look at 6.8 billion people. That We can't do that, of course. But if you turn the lights out and look down at Earth from about 300 miles up and allow it to rotate in front of you, so that you're looking at the nighttime view of the entire Earth, right? You can see just about 80% of us because of the lights that we give off with the electricity of where we live. Now, granted, there's a lot of people out there that don't have access to electricity, but but the majority of the 6.8 billion people do. That's a lot of people. Now, take half of those people. Half of those people will have one of the three entities that we're going to discuss now. Uh, Enterobius vermicularis, which is the pinworm mm -hmm. that almost every human being encounters during their uh, adolescent years. Have I encountered it? I believe you have, Vince, mm -hmm. and so have I. I think right. it's an almost considered normal inhabitant of the juvenile gut tract of humans. If I say that again, Enterobius vermicularis? Correct, and it's called the pinworm on purpose because the adult female worm has a straight, narrow tail that looks just like a pin. Lovely photo here in your book. Thank you. That's a montage, by the way. I actually had to stitch that one together by Photoshop because it was too big to actually photograph it under the microscope. Mm. So I took a series of in photographs cases. and put it together. It's, but yeah, it, it came out it nice. Fine. came out nice. Um, then we got two other parasites that are transmitted uh, in a similar fashion. But actually, when we discuss pinworm, you'll see why it's so popular. Uh, Trichuris, trichiura, which is called mm -hmm. the whip worm. Okay. As opposed to the pinworm. Pinworm, it, whipworm, all right. Oh, also because of its shape, it looks like a whip. Okay. And then finally, Ascaris lumbricoides, which is considered one of the uh, chief detractors of human health throughout the world. Now, if you add those three parasites together, let's just take the last two, Trichuris trichiura and Ascaris lumbricoides. It's estimated by WHO and lots of other health organizations throughout the world that about a third of the world has one or both of those parasites in their gut tracts. And of them, how many of them have Giardia or Toxo or Entamoeba or Cryptosporidium? Many. That's right. Now, now you're talking about it. And malaria too and Leishmaniasis. And um, if you go to Africa, perhaps Trypanosomiasis and South America, Chagas disease. So you've got a whole bunch of different entities that are invading the human host at any one moment. Do and they it, detract from us? Oh, my goodness. These well, worms. We will see. We will so see. these are all nematodes. They're nematodes. That's as correct. As opposed to the tapeworms, which are cestodes. That's correct. And what's the difference? Well, the cestodes are segmented and they're flat. They also don't have a gut. flat. Segmented, flat, and they don't have a gut tract. And remember, we had some basic sure. lessons in this. Just to reviewing. Just, just reviewing. reviewing, exactly right. It's so, okay to ask again? Oh, no question. You Please know, my do. son has a teacher who says <laughs> if you ask a question about something I've covered, you get points off. Oh, no. Are you going to take points off from me today? No way. I'll give you points for even thinking to ask the question. <laughs> Can you imagine how it would be penalized to ask a question? No. It's ridiculous. No. Nematodes are round. They are round. Without segments. Right. Can you name a round-segmented worm? Wait. It's not in my book. A round-segmented worm? That's right. Oh, an earthworm. Correct. Uh, right. They're free-living. What's Anelida is the name for earthworms. Anelida or Anelida. Either one is fine. Mm. That's right. We have a problem with Latin. We do. We know how to spell, but we don't know how the Romans might have pronounced that. But nematodes. the point is that... Um, I know another nematode. You do, eh? C. elegans. Exactly. What's the C stand for? Cenorhabditis. Excellent. A soil nematode, harmless it, but a wonderful laboratory subject. Bingo. And so we discussed this in brief last time, too, because we know how many genes the Cenorhabditis elegans organism contains, correct? We do, and we know how many cells <laughs> and where each cell starts and ends up during development. We know everything we know have to know about this organism from that standpoint, but we don't know everything about the organism, right? No. Because That's why we're still studying it, There's right? lots more to learn besides just the uh, size of its genome. So do we make parallels between uh, C. elegans and Ascaris and Trichuris and Enterobius? Enterobius? 
That, we, that does not slip off the tongue. I'm sorry. <laughs> and no, you, you have to use this uh, more than three times in order for mm. that word to be yeah, yours. Right. So the answer is they have a lot in common. All of these animals have a lot in common. They have a nervous system. They have a complete gut tract. They have a muscular system. They have a complete functional re, uh, reproductive system. And they also have an excretory system. And they have a primitive brain. Hmm. All right? It's called a ganglion, but... Uh, when you look at it, it actually coordinates the behavior of the animal. It's a couple of cells. How many cells is it? No, nah, it's more than a couple of cells. Hundred? Vince. It's a couple hundred cells. All right. It's about what I have. <laughs> yeah, me too. And Together, we equals two senorimbetazolicans. <laughs> and, and they don't have a visual system. They do not. I noticed you left that out. That's right. They don't. They do not. Although the, the trematodes have mm -hmm. a phototropism behavior pattern, so we think that they can detect, in a primitive way, sunlight. Mm -hmm. well, so, I'm sure these nematodes can sense chemicals, right? They can, of course they can, and they migrate towards or away from right. them, depending on whether they're attractive to them or not. Uh, and you can actually determine which nerves in Cenorhabditis elegans are responsible for that behavior mm -hmm. right. by ablating the nervous system uh, at that point and then seeing what happens. Right. So, um, in fact, when we discuss how these parasites know where they are in the host, it's all because of their nervous system and their ability to detect their microenvironment. So microhabitat is extremely important for parasite location once they're inside the host. So these three nematodes... They're referred to, in a general sense, as geohelminths. Geo meaning they're in the ground? They are. Hmm, that's they where are. they live. Well, they don't quite live there, but they mm -hmm. survive there, you see. Uh, and, we'll, and we'll get to their life cycles. Their life cycles are similar, but not identical. Of course, they're, they're, <coughs> they're not free living, are they? They're not. So the soil, they just sustain. That's correct. But they want a host, right? This is absolutely correct. So when we get to the uh, later members of this group, we have two others to discuss at another time. One of them is called hookworm, which mm -hmm. we've alluded to before as well. And the other one is strongyloides. And when we get to strongyloides, Stercoralis, now we've, we're at a break point in its evolutionary history. It can live as a free-living worm in the soil, mm -hmm. or it can live as a parasite inside of a warm-blooded host. C. elegans is a free-living worm. Correct. Nematode. It has no options. It doesn't need to be a parasite. Well, the need, or it has not been selected for life inside of a host. How's that for a better way of expressing what's interesting need. is that here we have some very related nematodes that have very different lifestyles no question and then of course the one you mentioned can switch that's right well that's neat yeah and it's all environmentally determined as to what it does i would guess that the ability to switch would be genetically costly and that's why everyone is not endowed with that ability <laughs> and yet it also improves your versatility and distribution so it has some advantages as well as, or perhaps disadvantages. But obviously it's not the answer because not everyone does no. that, right? No, no, no. Remember when we discussed the number of genes, we also compared and contrasted that to at least uh, one organism, which we know has uh, more genes than Cenorhabditis elegans and is still a nematode. So we, we, we speculated that perhaps if you had a complete repertoire of genes, you could live comfortably free living because you can do everything you need to do mm -hmm. out outdoors, right? But it turns out to be not the case. Uh, parasitic nematodes seem to have more genes, many more genes, in fact, than free-living worms. I think you asked me that once. I did. Who would have a, more it genes? It was a trick question. I got the right answer, though. <laughs> so, um, Cenorhabditis elegans has about 19,300 and, what, 26 or something like that. I forget the exact number, but it's listed down in here someplace. Genes? Yeah, at least at the time of the writing of this uh, book. In 1980. Uh, okay, 19,080. Writing, genes. yes. Right. So, Trichinella has 40% um, more DNA. Yeah. So, we assume that that 40% includes genes which allows it to survive inside of a host and ward off the immune system, it's for instance. It's not easy to like, be a parasite. You know, it's not. It's a tough life. It's, it's a tough life. These are soil transmitted <laughs> helminths. They are. And I notice you have an, an acronym STH. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And. Uh, the unholy trinity. Is that <laughs> right. what they're That called? was not my uh, my reference. That was uh, Harold W. Brown, who was my mentor in <laughs> college here, <laughs> often referred to them as the unholy trinity because they are often found together in the same person. Really, yeah. all three. All hmm. three. That's pinworm for sure because everybody, you know, it's it's not a pathogen by itself. Okay, as we'll see as we discuss the life cycle and its uh, clinical ramifications. But the other two parasites. 
um, can be pathogenic. It depends on how many of them there are inside mm-hmm. of you. Okay, so it's a dose-dependent thing here. Okay, now, so, go ahead. Nope, nope. Are there any things in common among these, the Holy Trinity here? Oh, well, the they're all nematodes, of course. They're all nematodes. This, morphologically, they're a, bit, they're a bit different. They're all different. They're all different. And, uh, in fact, they get their names from their shapes. So, uh, yeah. the pinworms. Pinworm, the pinworm whipworm. And uh, the giant intestinal nematode, which is what they refer to Ascaris as. It's really big, right? It's as big as your pen. My pen? It's as big as your pen on this I, table right well, here. I thought it was very long. Nope. Nope. I should have brought a jar of them with me. I have a jar of them with me over at my author office. And, really? Uh, yeah, I could bring some. You over. know, if you've been walking down the street with that. <laughs> In New York City, you don't get stopped for things like that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, people with jars of worms, uh, we see them all the time on the street. Hmm. Sometimes they're selling them, sometimes they're buying them. We don't know. <clears throat> that, that was just a joke in passing here. All right. So now we have three to talk about. This we do. Excellent. And we, we do. are we starting with Enterobius? I believe we are. And the reason why we're starting with Enterobius is because... It's and, first in your book. Well, not only... No, it isn't. Actually, Giardia is first. But the reason why it's the first nematode to discuss is because it almost doesn't classify as a parasite. Why is that? Well, because of what it eats. Mm-hmm. And what do you think pinworm eats? And I'll tell you where it lives first. It lives in the descending colon. So it's a soil guy, but it really wants to be in the descending colon of humans or many mammals? No, just humans. Only humans, nobody yeah, but, else. But every mammal has its own species of pinworm. Isn't that they have, interesting? They have different names. Yeah, well, okay. different shapes and different, they're actually, their genomes are different too. And what does it want to eat? I Good. don't know. Yeah, well, it's got a complete gut tract, so it, what is... It, Probably wait. what we're di- what we're rejecting, because <laughs> no, no. our, our colon has all the garbage, right? Oh, no, Vince. Bacteria? <laughs> There you go. A lot of bacteria there. That's mm-hmm. only bacteria, right? And some of the digested materials. So that that's we... what these guys want, bacteria. So what does Cinerobatus elegans eat? Bacteria. Bingo. Mm-hmm. So they're, they're obviously intimately related in terms of their meal selection, okay? They have quite a selection down there in the colon. Now, the only thing that I don't know about, and I don't think anybody else has ever tried this, is to whether you can grow mm-hmm. Enterobius vermicularis in vitro. Maybe one of our listeners out there knows the answer to that. As far as I know, this has never been grown in vitro. Are there mouse versions? There are. And you can't grow them in notobiotic mice, Yeah, there, can there are you? several. You can, no, that's right. You can't. And we're going to come to that, too. So one of them is called Cyphacea obvolata, mm-hmm. and the other one is called Aspicularis tetrapida. Now, how do I remember that, Vince? Because you worked on them your whole life, or you talked about them. Anyway. <laughs> well, I, I actually, when I was a technician here in 1962, I was placed in charge of a mouse colony. Ah. And it was invariably contaminated with mouse pinworms. And so they used to give them something to get rid of them. Periodically, we have a problem in our mouse colony here. That's right. And what do you think they give them? Um, they give them um, ivermectin. They could. That's one. I think so. Ivermectin is an interesting compound. We'll get to that, too, when we discuss the mode of action of these drugs. But they used to give them something called gentian violet. Okay. And gentian violet is a, it's a vital stain for bacteria. Hey, when your kid has uh, candida, they give them gentian violet they, as they a first do. try, and their mouth That's gets right. all purple. And you got it. Everything gets purple. There used to be these little purple pills that people swallowed to get rid of their pinworms. Hmm. And that was called that was the gentian so violet. So it's toxic for the worm, but not you. Yeah, here's a here's an old world story for you, Vince. This is how I made a little extra money on the side. Harold Brown used to drug test Which for side, companies. Which side, the left or the right? <laughs> the, the side that my wallet is on. <laughs> he used to come in to the laboratory, and there were many of us in the lab uh, serving as his technicians. And uh, he said, "Well, okay, whose turn is it to take these pills?" And, you know, we were all vying to take them, by the way. Why? Well, I'll tell you why. Because uh, you take them for three days, and then on the fourth, fifth, and sixth days, you collect an entire day's worth of stool Mm -hmm. per day. And then with these uh, large screening devices, all right, these handheld brass screens of various sizes, you you screened your stool through the screen, and you were looking for little bits and pieces of the uh, pills that didn't break up. And the company was using us mm-hmm. to tell whether or not that particular batch of coating was uh, functional 
or dysfunctional with regards to dissolving in the this small intestine. before IRBs, isn't it? Way before IRBs, way before. I, so we had one technician that said, I've bought three new pairs of shoes with the money that I got from doing my own stool exams. That's why you wanted to do it, because you got paid. You get a little extra money. They give you five bucks a, a shot or something like this. And uh, and we, we, we all enjoyed and didn't enjoy, of course. <laughs> yeah, I can't imagine you would want to do that. Under the fume hood, siphoning our stool through this uh, set of screens to look for those little pieces of mm. uh, <laughs> blue pill that didn't break up. Yeah, yeah. right. That's the old days. You wouldn't get that anymore because, frankly, they don't use that drug anymore to treat pinworm, right? They use lots of other things like mabendazole and things like that, but we'll get to that. So here's okay. pinworm as an adult living in your large intestine eating Bacteria. bacteria. Okay. That'd it doesn't be... even attach to your gut wall. It just swims. And it doesn't get against... shoved out? Sometimes. Mm -hmm. Sometimes. And in fact, that's occasionally how you make the diagnosis. How, you big? Actually... how big is it? Yeah. It's a couple of millimeters long. I guess I, I list the size of it over 10 here. 10 millimeters, yeah. So Centimeter. it's big enough to see with your naked eye. So the, the parasitology technician that gets the stool sample sent to them every day, he opens up this, we used to call them ice cream containers, but let's not refer to them as that. They're even those white cardboard things. <laughs> white yeah. cardboard things, right, that you get your <laughs> soup in. <laughs> so everybody says, oh, I don't want that anymore. You open this container up and there's a, a, a large amount of stool. If it's freshly collected, there is the option of just looking on the surface of the stool. You'd manipulate that with a tongue depressor to look for the adult pinworms. That tongue would be depressor, an ice cream container, a tongue <laughs> depressor. Well, it's depressing just to think about oh. that, but <clears throat> nonetheless, okay. you could occasionally spot these little white wiggly things on the surface. And they're so, moving. Oh, yeah. But how many would you have in you? Depends on, on the thousands stage of the thousands. infection. There are stages. Oh, yeah. Mm. It, it, it depends on your stage of right. development, whether right. you're a, a baby, a, a two-year-old, a ten-year-old, or an, an adult. Uh, it probably... Probably. We, we, we know already that this parasite is an adolescent acquired parasite. Some from about the age of six months old until puberty. Yeah. That's where you'd find the majority of these infections. Although the heaviest infection I ever saw as a technician was in the w wife of a medical student who was undergoing what we thought and we were told this. She was, uh, she was leading a very stressful life. She was uh, working a full-time job, trying to support her husband, who was then going through medical school. And there was a, a child involved as well. She caught the pinworm from her child, and uh, she had literally hundreds of thousands of worms. Mm. And I'll tell you how we make this diagnosis, too, so that's a, kind of an interesting twist to this. It's... I was going to say a pain in the ass, but it's not. <laughs> it's, it's, it's just next to the... Uh, the anus, that these worms actually migrate out of the host at night while the host is sleeping to Wait, either... Wait, let me get this. When yeah. you're sleeping, they crawl out your they anus? Do, they do, they do, they do. Where are they heading? Where are they going? They are trying to lay their eggs on the perianal region next I to see. the... Uh, and then they'll go back in? Some of them try that, but usually it's a death throw for the parasite okay. at that point. Why do they want to lay their eggs there? So they'll spread somewhere else? Apparently, that's the way this life cycle is transmitted. So let's let's back off this and say that these female worms will produce eggs. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are there also male worms? Oh, yeah. It has to be male worms here, too. All right. But but you're right to ask the question because when we get to strangeloides, you'll see what the answer is there. And it's not an obvious answer either. So with, with the uh, nematodes in general, there are dimorphic sexual differences between mm -hmm. males and females. The female worm, after these worms mate in the large intestine, the, the male worms actually die. And so they pass out. Mm -hmm. Just like us after we mate. Yeah, I used to say that, but sometimes the medical students got it and sometimes they didn't. All right, so the, now the female worm is impregnated. She's, she's going to produce eggs. She's got the sperm from the male, mm -hmm. which are amoeboid, by the way. These aren't even flagellated sperm. They're amoeboid in, in shape. She stores them, and then as the eggs are produced, they're fertilized. Okay. Okay, so this female worm might accumulate uh, several hundred eggs, and then when her uterus fills up, mm -hmm. she's ready to actually expel them. They don't expel them while they're living in the small intestine, or large, large. intestine, rather. Mm -hmm. They actually uh, commit suicide, basically. <laughs> they either um, evert their uterus and out come the eggs, and of course they die at the same time, 
or they just migrate onto the perianal region and then they just disintegrate. And when they do so, of course, the eggs are there. Now, in either case, the host is exposed to the to the worm's body fluids that actually maintains this uh, turgid pressure inside the worm that it allows it to assume a round shape. This fluid contains lots of proteins, and some of those proteins are highly uh, allergenic. And children that have this infection, to begin with, of course, there's no symptoms. But as the um, infection becomes synchronous, so here are these eggs sitting on your perianal region. Hence, they're infectious six hours later. I mean, you mean they hatch? No. They go from a single cell mm -hmm. to a fully formed larva in six hours. That's a remarkably fast developmental cycle. In fact, it's as fast a growing cycle in parasite the world as the Humboldt squid is for organisms in general. Mm -hmm. Have you ever read about the Humboldt no. squid? No. I just saw a program on that last night, so I just thought I'd mention that as by comparison. It's thought to be the fastest growing animal. Hmm. It starts out as a uh, small um, hatched, I guess you call it a hatchling, uh, on year one. And by year two, the thing is six and a half feet long. Two years. It goes from a tiny little organism to something that is so big that occasionally one of these squid will eat another squid of its mm -hmm. own kind mm -hmm. in order to keep growing because it's got this compulsion to just, I've got to eat, I've got to grow because they only live for two years. Really? That's it. And what happens then? They lay their eggs and die. They lay their eggs. And die. Wow. So this parasite lives for six weeks. The adult worm lives six weeks. Mm -hmm. That's it. And, and then the male she, dies after mating. <coughs> right. The female lays her eggs and dies. Right, and that takes six weeks for the eggs to develop. And then once she does, the eggs are deposited on the perianal region. They encounter oxygen. It stimulates the growth of the larva inside. And six hours later, the darn thing is infectious. And then you make little worms. Or again, well, now you have worms. to swallow this somehow. Wait, so what form is it when you say they're infectious? Does it look like a tiny pinworm at that point? No, it's an egg. So it looks, look at this here. The egg is infectious. You have a picture here I of do. eggs embryonating on the perianum. That's correct. So what is the larger? That's the female. And this is the, she's laying the eggs. Those are the eggs. She has a thing out. coming out of her. Which That's is, the prolapsed uterus. And the tiny, tiny guys are the eggs, which are That's these. That's correct. And those eggs uh, become, they embryonate. But they are not infectious at that point. And six hours later, they are. That's right. And which means then if you ingest them, they will grow into, they will hatch into small pinworms. You got are it. Are they now called larvae, a, I guess? Yeah, larvae. They're, so they're, it has to happen in your gut? Not necessarily. That's a good question, of mm -hmm. course. So the, the let me let me you take the listener back to the adult parasite laying on the perianal region at the moment she expels the eggs. When she expels these eggs, they're they're fertilized, but they're not embryonated. Okay. They're a single cell, but it's a fertilized egg. It's a zygote. It's six hours later mm -hmm. when the female dies and disintegrates, and the eggs are now in the same milieu of that area. They're fully infectious. Something from the female makes that happen? No, no. It's an exposure of the, embryo, of the fertilized egg to oxygen. Okay. And it jump starts the developmental cycle. Starts to divide. And it's a remarkably fast division. Mm -hmm. I mean, think about it, Vince. It goes from an, a single egg to a larva that you can almost see with your naked eye. In six hours. Six hours. Okay. It's and amazing. This can happen on the perianal region. Yes, but it, it, it can also happen underneath your fingernails as okay. you're scratching this area. Because it's itchy? It does, over time, get itchy because the female worms, upon redepositing and redepositing and redepositing over these cycles that develop, mm -hmm you start to respond to these worm secretions and allergens. And you scratch at the same time. So you're mm -hmm. scratching them into the skin, into the, uh, maybe even into the, um, the, the, the layer below the epidermis. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're actually uh, injecting. So that will start, and so those the worms will go through the circulation? No, the worms won't, but their secretions that, uh, that were, or the body fluid proteins which makes you will scratch. certainly uh, get involved in the immune system. Right. And once that occurs, you've got this allergic response that's set up on the skin, and it starts Itchy. to itch like crazy. You scratch it, you get it under your fingernails. Which forces you to scratch even harder. And this, of course, favors the transmission of the worm because little kids put their fingers in, in, their, mouth. in their mouths as they sleep. 
Sure. But they're also scratching like crazy sometimes, okay? So at the end yeah. of the night, they may have accumulated hundreds of eggs under their fingernails. Wow. At which point, you know, they're doing this during the day and all it's that. It's a this. cycle forever and ever. That's right. So eventually you can build up very large numbers of worms very fast like this, all right? And it takes this parasite, like I said, it's a six-week cycle between infection orally and the production of females with eggs. And these... Larvae can go through your your stomach, your small intestine, and everything, no problem. And then they hatch. And then they hatch where? In the large intestine. So they're resistant to all of that. They before. are. They are. And, and not only that, they get these um, environmental cues as to where they are. So they don't hatch until mm -hmm. they know exactly where they are. They're in this large intestine. This, not in the small uh, intestine. It's a six-week cycle. Got it. From birth to death. That's it. Now, here's the question. Well, there are the. many, there are many. <laughs> How did the kid get it in the first place? From another kid, probably. And where did school. that kid get it? At, from another kid, of Ad course. Ad infinitum. You got it. So it's yeah. just passed from kid to kid. The kids are, you know, touching each other at school. Sure. They pass it on. The medical student, their she got child. got from her child. But the child was a baby. He was just born. Probably right? at a daycare center. I didn't say she was just I see, born. I see. It was probably, a, you know. So it's always from someone else. It's always from someone else. It's not from an animal. Okay. So animals don't transmit this. It so does this go people. on forever and we never notice it? Or is at some point there's yeah. a symptom? And <clears throat> well, you could go to any grade school or kindergarten mm -hmm. and take a white glove and go along all of the tops of the uh, shelves. Yes. And take that back to the lab and do an examination of that stuff. Could it be full of pinworms? It could be. Wow. So exactly. the teachers get infected too? Well, that, we're getting to that. Okay. So they're not susceptible. Is there a downside to having these pinworms? Well, if you're a little kid, if you're a little kid and your perianal region becomes so sensitive, oh, okay, you can have problems. That you can get secondary infections, sure. and that's where the um, innocent bystander effect occurs. Okay, and you're, you're right where the feces is. So there's a wonderful chance of including any of the bacterial species that might mm -hmm. be occupying your gut tract at any one time. So at that point, you go to the physician because the, the child's anus is inflamed. They're not sleeping well. They're mm -hmm. crying. They're you know they're exhibiting signs of. Uh, so he'll take he or she will take a stool sample, give it to the Dixon uh, de Pommier Parasitology Lab. And if they do, we'll never find it. No. Ever. You can't look at it. Well, what did you say I got? Feces. That's not where the eggs are, Ben. No, but what are the worms are in the feces, right? Sometimes, if you're ah, lucky. Ah, the eggs are perianal. So you put, right. you put scotch tape there? How did you guess? <laughs> I remember that from years ago. I think That's exactly from right. Dr. Brown, when he taught us at Mount Sinai, <laughs> the scotch tape. Psh. Look at that. You did have Dr. Brown as a lecturer, didn't you? He lectured in my micro course. Sure. Wow. And they said, from Columbia, here is the famous Dr. Brown. And little did I know, you were working in his <laughs> lab at the time. Oh, not at the time, but... I, I, this was 1970. <clears throat> Uh, 75 to 79. So Harold Brown had retired from Columbia by that time. Really? So he was just lecturing. And Michael Katz, who was the chairman of pediatrics. Uh, who I met at your party, your birthday right. party. He took over for her, Dr. Brown. Oh, he was a parasitologist as well. Oh, yeah. Michael Katz. Pediatrician. Okay. So, uh, and then eventually I inherited the course. From scotch Michael. tape. So the physician would Well, we, we refer scotch. to it as clear sticky tape. Clear sticky tape. We okay. don't use uh, brand yeah, yeah, names okay. in Sorry. this Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Scotch 3M, whatever. Right, right. <laughs> it's not impugning you. Unless, tape. of course, they'd like to help support this show. But the, the <clears> physician <throat> would put tape on and then put it in an envelope and give it to the lab. Well, it's more complicated. You have to use a clear slide, a glass slide, right? Oh, I see. And what you do is you tape part of the down to the slide, and then you evert the sticky side. Right. And use that to press up against the perianal region, and you, you dab it in right. various places, and then you smooth it on the other side of the slide. I see. Then you clear it in xylol. Mm hmm And what's left is what you can see here. The eggs, embryonated eggs. That's right. And you put it under... Actually... You don't even have to stain it. You don't have to stain it. These things look just like... Um, they're flat on one side and round on the other side. And boom, positive for Got the diagnosis. pinworm. Got it. So the you know, physician could do it in his or her office, right? They could, but they don't. They, they don't want to be bothered with that. But what happens when you do find it? That's, That's the, a question. the big question is what do you do about it? Meprobium, is that what you called it? The drug? Meprobium? <laughs> Mabendazole. Mabendazole. <laughs> What's the program? I, I like that name, though. I think we should <laughs> substitute that one. <laughs> so 
So mebendazole. <clears throat> You'd give the kid mebendazole and the infection is cleared? The infection gets cleared from the adults, but it doesn't touch the larvae that are developing. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what you have to do is a week later follow it up with another dose. I see. And that way you'll get the adults and the larvae. But, of course, if the kid's in school... You get it again. And again and again. Wow. So why don't you and I have it? We don't have it, by the way. I'm not itchy. Nope. <laughs> you don't have to reveal your personal habits here, but I don't have it either. I can tell the audience, hey, neither Vince nor I... How would I know if I had it? It's a good question. Well, I think that adults, if they do have it, develop very mild uh, infections, and therefore you wouldn't know. It would be an inapparent infection, as they would say. But some adults do, as I mentioned before, um, develop very high loads of worms, and as a result of that, you do develop symptoms. Mm -hmm, the perianal itching. That's right. Okay. But, so, what, who cares? I mean, this is not a life-threatening parasite by any means, and People aren't dying from this thing. They never did. Um, they never will. But when the parent of a child finds out that their kid has a worm... Yeah, they freak out, right? They do, they do, they do. So they right. want to get rid of everything. So one of the big mistakes you can make on this one is you can become hyper-clean. And, for instance, there were parents recorded to have taken the bed sheets off their kids' beds every day to make sure that their mm -hmm. bed sheets were not contaminating their environment again. <clears throat> and what this would do is every time they would lift the sheets off the bed and <laughs> flop them in the air to put them into the hamper, it would just distribute the eggs throughout the entire room. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if the eggs don't dry out, they could be infectious by coming in contact like that. So you know little kids are in the habit of something called pica, where they put any inanimate object, and sometimes animate objects, mm -hmm. in their mouth. Sure, sure. And if the egg happens to rest on one of those objects and they get it in their mouth and swallow it, they've got the infection. Wow. It's easy to acquire. Very. So you probably can't get rid of it, really. Probably can't, but you can control the level of the infection with yeah. mebendazole so that this itching syndrome doesn't come in. What fraction of the U.S. would have this at childhood, say? 100%. Really? 100%. Wow, so my kids had it, yeah. but I didn't notice because they no. didn't have any symptoms. That's right. So so why don't teenagers or adults have it? So it's a common childhood infection then goes away. It does. It just goes away. So why well, does do it we, go away? Do we make an immune response? And that... <clears throat> we don't. No? No, that's not what we think it goes away. We think it goes away because of some hormonal imbalance that occurs. Mm -hmm. Well, I wouldn't say imbalance, but immaturity. The immaturity of the gut tract during the development of uh, an individual to puberty, right, allows this parasite to persist in the gut tract. And then after that, the conditions are totally different. Now, what conditions are totally different? That's a good question, right? What do we know about the maturation of the lower bowel from, say, the time you're born until the time you reach puberty? What do we know about that? I'll tell you what we don't know about it. We don't even know how many species of bacteria live in our gut tract. Yeah, lots. We think it's over 40,000, Vince. Mm. Over 40,000 well, different that, species that of bacteria. probably changes as you mature, right? Of course it does. And in fact, what they found using uh, proteomics um, <clears throat> in identical twins that had been separated in their lives and then brought back together for this study is that only 30% of the uh, microflora of their gut tract is in common. 70% is different. Right. So that's um, attributable to their, in, their acquiring these, inf these uh, in infections. I'll call them infections, even though they're not um, pathological infections. They're normal infections. Over the lifespan of <clears throat> just living a normal life, you touch your computer, you touch this table, mm -hmm. and, and there are different populations of microbes there, and sometimes you inadvertently put your hand in your mouth. And you've got those microbes, and they're sure. different. <clears throat> that doesn't explain why E, why, why e, uh, e vermicularis does not survive past puberty in 99% of the humans. There's got to be some physiological basis for this rather than an immunological basis for it, unless, of course, you hypothesize that the lower part of the bowel develops its immune system last, and that's coincident with yeah, the onset sure. of puberty. And that's a pretty big stretch of um, hypothesis to try to test. So how would you even go about investigating this? And uh, 
people sort of shrug their shoulders and say, you know, it's not an important pathogen, so therefore you don't devote a lot of time or money to it. And yeah, that's why that, we don't know the answer. You have to have priorities, right? Right. But, you know, it would be interesting to find out because maybe by knowing that, there is another more serious entity mm -hmm. hanging around that would also be explainable by the same mechanism. So biological data has a way of uh, permeating throughout biology to uh, to empower you with the knowledge that you would need in order to solve a completely different problem sure, once you've sure. understood the architecture of the gut tract, let's say, for instance. Mm -hmm. In this case, uh, we don't know what new knowledge we would uncover by simply discovering why it doesn't survive in an adolescent, but I wish we knew. Occasionally, occasionally, someone comes to the operating table for appendicitis. Mm -hmm. and what you're looking at here is a figure from a patient who had an appendicitis, and when they took out the appendix and they sectioned it to find out what was wrong, they discovered it was loaded with pinworms. Mm. So that's a little called a, kind of a cul-de-sac, which accumulated pinworms. And so for many, many years, it was hypothesized that pinworms might be responsible for appendicitis attacks. And that was dispelled when they decided to just knuckle down and do... 5,000 consecutive appendicitis and... Appendectomies. Or appendectomies, <laughs> as the other word is, of course, for that, and that was the correct word, of course, and looked to see whether or not it's associated with pinworms. And they didn't find one pinworm infection in right. all of them. Because mostly it's an adult thing. But here's one that's not, that mm. came out to be, well, those pinworms are in the appendix, but it, sure. those pinworms... So it was just there, it didn't... Coincidental it. finding. Yes. Now, you mentioned the, the female spouse of the medical student who mm -hmm. had a very heavy infection. I did. So some adults can be infected. That's right. What? How many? What fraction? Very low? We have, <clears throat> excuse me, we have almost no clue about this because most of the adult infections go undetected and most people experience an occasional perianal itch or two and attribute it to lots of different things, but you may, maybe you had a hot and spicy meal the night before sure. that or something <clears throat> sure. else. Not, certainly not to a parasite. So Are, are there any conditions where uh, these can be life-threatening infections? They don't become systemic? They don't go in your brain like neurocystis sarcosis? You're right. No? You know, nothing that I've known about in the literature of this from the time I've been paying attention right. to it until now has uh, any reference at all to lethality or even high mor morbidity. Even in, say, an AIDS patient? Nope. So let me ask you this. Could it be that this is beneficial? Ah, Vince, good question. Uh, that's a very valid question, too, because it appears that almost everybody has it at one time in their it's life. Benign. And they don't have it. It's benign. Well, if, yeah. it's ben if it's not benign, maybe it's beneficial, right? Sure. Maybe it's, it's part of our uh, experience, yeah. It, it certainly is part of our experience. There's no question about that. It's uh, it's it's one of us for a while, at least. So um, you can raise animals in the lab that which yep. aren't infected. This is and all true. How do they differ? That's uh, the question. Right? <coughs> well, uh, as far as I know, no one's actually with just pinworm. Right. Specifically asked that question, okay? Of course, hookworm is another story. Yeah, or we'll get to that. Or or some of these other things that are more uh, pathogenic. But uh, as far as I know, nobody's ever done any germ-free work with um, either Syphacia or um, or that other pinworm that I mentioned earlier that I knew the name of, but now I don't. Tetrapida. Mm -hmm. uh, the Aspicularis. Sorry, Aspicularis tetrapida. So I don't know of anybody that's actually done those things to say whether or not even bacteria are necessary for its life. Mm -hmm. And, and well, since this worm eats bacteria and so the other species, you could imagine that, well, the only thing it would have is uh, sloughed dead cells to sure. feed on, yeah, right? Sure, sure. They may be able to make a living out of it, but uh, apparently bacteria is their main food. So um, you mentioned that there are in separate species for animals. Every That's animal right. has its own. Is right. the transmission cycle more or less the same? It is. It is. It's trans but animals don't all scratch themselves back there, right? True, but they are certainly casual with their fecal distribution system. But and the eggs are not in the feces, right? Well, on some of those other animals, they turn out to be. Yeah, just in humans, this, this is the case. But in mice, for instance, you can find the eggs in the stool. So uh, their life cycle is slightly different. 
Dogs? As far as I know. Eggs in the stool? Yeah. Horses? Because this behavior of, of scratching yourself and, yeah. and then touching your fingers during the night is not an animal. It's a human thing, but... Yeah, or know. maybe a primate thing. Maybe primate, but dogs and beavers and bears, you know, they're not, well, they have these big claws. If they start scratching themselves... The dogs, as you know, have access to every anatomical portion of their body except their neck. Yeah, the dog I could see, but a bear with those big claws, Dixon. Uh, oof, it would be lethal for the bear, I think. It so it's that. probably the, the eggs are in but the they stool. They rub up against trees and stuff. Yeah? We know that. We know that. Okay, so, so they could rub up against it's possible. trees, yeah. It's possible, but I think a lot of the other animal species of uh, nematodes, particularly these, are um, transmitted in the fecal contamination. Whereas human beings, for this one at least, no. But we'll get... Yeah. The next one is more exciting so if you're the physician here and you want to tell the, p the patient's um, parents that uh, they have nothing to worry about of course yes <clears throat> you will assure them that uh, hey i had it as a kid my kids had it yeah my grandchildren will have it and it doesn't upset me to know that they've had worms particularly this worm because yeah. it's benign in its behavior okay and uh, so now how do you get rid of it and the answer is you don't. You just keep treating it. When the levels build up to a certain level and the kid starts to exhibit restless right. behavior again, right. you treat him with mebendazole and, and it lowers the number of worms again and starts the cycle again. No, we've, we've never had to do that, so maybe it's a low infection or whatever. But do you, do you mount any kind of an immune response you do. that you might pick up in the serum, say, as a diagnostic? Good question. Antibodies? I... You know, this is such an easy test to run, uh, but <laughs> but there's a language problem here, too, and I'll, g I'll give you an anecdote. I think your our listening audience loves anecdotes. So, so while I was a technician here in 1962, I had the I encountered the following problem with a, a Spanish-speaking uh, family. They had uh, three children, and uh, one of the children's uh, scotch tape or clear stick tape test was positive for <laughs> For pinworm. Mm -hmm. So the recommendation was, of course, that the other kids be checked out. Sure. So they, uh, we did the first test on the first child, but we wanted them to do the next one because the best time to take these uh, tests is just after the kid wakes up. Right. So none of us spoke Spanish, so what we had was this little demonstration to show them how to do the test. So we had this little doll, okay, and we took the doll, and, and it was not clothed, and we bent it over backwards and then we took the sticky tape and we bent it down and we put it up against the doll's buttocks and then put it back over the slide, put it in the box, closed the lid and said, now you bring it back to us. And they all nodded, yes, 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 we know what we're doing. Yes, we do. A week later, and do everybody now, do the, uh, the man and wife mm -hmm. uh, team and their children. They brought back a bottle filled with slides taken every day for a week. And there wasn't one positive in the bunch. But we knew one of those kids was positive, right? So we got frustrated, and we tried to explain it to him again. He says, they did exactly what we said to do. Mm -hmm. Really? How could you have done exactly what we said and missed this kid because he was loaded, right? So finally, uh, the chief technician came back from vacation. Her name was Anna Gonzalez, and she was a Spanish speaker. So we asked Anna to please speak with these people and find out where we went wrong or they went wrong. And she said she came back with a big smile on her face. And she says, I, I can tell you what they did, but you won't believe it. After watching the demonstration, they went next door to the five and ten cent store and they doll. bought a doll for <laughs> each person <laughs> and they, they took the scotch tape and pushed it up against the buttocks of the doll and of course none, That's of, the dolls amazing. Were, none of the dolls were positive so it's a great story because it's true and number two it says public health education has to be done in such a way that there's no possibility for misinterpretation and using a doll as a prop is okay if you're an English speaker and everybody understands the analogy but if hmm. these people don't speak English um, you've got a, a set of problems on your hands you better be very explicit as to what you do because uh, they're going to miss the point every time on that one and it's your fault not theirs yeah, of course. You did exactly right. what you said. <laughs> yeah, well, now you would go to Google and type it. <laughs> Google Translate and type in a phrase, not the doll, to yourself. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. So when, when they went back and did the test, all three kids were positive, by the way. <laughs> all three in the adults? <laughs> Negative. Interesting. Negative. That was typical. 
Very typical. So New York City is full of it, right? Dynamite. Absolutely. So right. here's a question for it's you. All over the What's place. the mass of all the <laughs> pinworms on Earth? It must be huge. <laughs> it must be. There's a certain biomass associated with this. I mean, there are a lot of beetles we know. But <clears throat> That's true. Also a lot of pinworms. There's a lot of stuff out there, Vince. Hmm. There's a lot of stuff. <clears throat> all right. Now we have to make a decision, Professor. Yes. We can either... It's It's been an hour. Wow. That we, was quick. We can do some email and then wrap it up. Let's do email because I think that we want to not dilute the next two topics. No. I think these are great. I love this. I mean, I, I, I enjoy I, it. Of course, I used to enjoy teaching this too. Well, you still teach, you know. Well, this is teaching. Let's read some email. All right. And um, then we couldn't wrap it up. Very good. All right. Let's see what we have here. An email from Brian. Uh-huh. Ah. So uh, <laughs> Brian sent a picture. Mm. Let me show you. If I can find it here, because you have to see this. Now, where would it be? Hmm. Oh, I, I know where it is, yeah. Um, I'm a vertical cow farm. Here we go. <laughs> so he sent this picture of a cow <laughs> slope in Switzerland. <laughs> All right? Right. So Daniel is from Switzerland, and he said, I'm sorry, Brian, love your podcast and did not drink from the streams in Switzerland because of the cows at all altitudes. Smart thinking. Even though your Giardia cast only came up on my return. Right. I guess he went to Switzerland. Yeah, well, cows from, don't carry Giardia, but he was thinking of cryptosporidia. The streams. The streams. You can get Giardia from streams, right? You can, of course. Beaver but, fever. But not from cows. No. Uh, but he hasn't talked about a cow yet. <clears throat> Okay. I've attached a picture of the Swiss version of vertical farming. <laughs> this is far from the most precipitous slope we found cows on, having only a 20% or so grade, but it is the only one we took a picture of. When the angle gets over 50 degrees or so, it's mostly sheep and goats. Right. But some cows even then. If the cow tipping phenomenon ever got started over here, the cows would probably tip down a few thousand feet. <laughs> So there are two different subjects. One is that right, he went right, to Switzerland right, right. and got didn't it, get Giardia, and then That's he good. saw the vertical form here. <laughs> you get it, Dixon? I, I got it. I got it. He's okay, just okay. trying to be funny and amuse you. Well, I'm amused. Because he knows you like amusement. I'm highly amused. Thank, Thank you, you, Brian. Brian. <laughs> Matthew writes, Professors, I just finished listening to episode 17. Cool. And your note about the Israeli study showing that asymptomatic giardiasis can result in higher growth rates in children than the control Got me thinking. Do you remember that? I do. Forgive it's me Richard if Richard Deckelbaum's results. That's right. Forgive me if this is something that you have already covered, but couldn't a parasitic species, not necessarily Giardia in this case, eventually evolve into a symbiont and vice versa? Sure. Do we have any examples of this? Although we have bacterial symbionts in the gut tract, do humans carry any eukaryotic symbionts? Just curious. Well, I think uh, the pinworm organism that we just discussed might qualify as that. But it's Might. not there forever. The bacteria no. are in our guts forever. No, not necessarily, Vince. Unless we get rid of them with antibiotics. Right, right and then they completely change. Well, we don't actually get rid of them. We just change the populations, right? Yeah, my guess is that our populations are always changing. But no eukaryotic symbionts. <coughs> so you think a pinworm is close to one? Yeah, I do. I'm trying to think of some other protozoans. And uh, there are a bunch of them that we didn't mention because they're not pathogens, okay? So... Um, yeah. They're not found in everyone, though. That's the point. They're not found in everyone. Non-pathogenic. Sure, we've got... Uh, oh, commensals. Entamoeba coli. Okay, mm -hmm. that's uh, another E. coli, but it's entamoeba coli in this case. Right. It's a, an almost look-alike for E. histolytica. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got a lot of flagellates, okay, mm -hmm. which don't cause us any harm. Amoeba? Well, no, 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 flagellates. It says here commensal amoeba. Yeah, yeah, no, that's... Um, that's the E. coli. And then Iotamoeba butchleii, and then there's one called Endolimax nana, but uh, many people believe that that is a pathogen. What does commensal mean? Commensal probably refers to the neutrality of the relationship. So a symbiont. Well, it is a symbiont. I mean, yeah. uh, they're all symbionts, okay? Even if they're pathogens, they're symbionts. But you have to say sim symbiosis is a relationship between two uh, animals of, of different species. Okay. So like a fungus and an algae combined together to make a lichen. Okay. So that's a symbiotic relationship, which is mutualistic because the algae can't live without the fungus and the fungus mm -hmm. can't live without the algae. So that's called mutualism. That's a form of symbiosis. Then we have commensalism, which is hard for most biologists to accept because 
at least one of those two organisms are benefiting from the association, which means that yeah. the, the housing for the commensal is your large intestine or small intestine, and you're giving a benefit to that organism, okay? So if they were writing this book, they would say humans are our best friends because we live in their guts. On the other hand, humans would say, well, E. coli, that's Entamoeba coli in this case, is neither my friend nor my enemy. They just sit there. They don't do anything. They eat a few bacteria. They reproduce at a very low rate. They don't penetrate the tissues. It's commensal then. It's a neutral or commensal organism. That's correct. So the way you say it here is that um, <clears throat> we are colonized with many uh, entities in our gut tract and other places. And um, the majority of those have caused us no harm. Right. We refer to them as commensals or symbionts. Commensals do us no harm. Symbionts actually help maintain our homeostatic mechanisms. Yeah, I, I think if I were to rewrite this, and I will, <laughs> I, I would be more precise in okay. my definition of a symbiont. A number of commensal protozoan species have been selected for life within us, and you yeah. have mentioned some of them, and also some commensal flagellated protozoa, Trichomonas sure. tenax, That's right. hominis, entromonas hominis, yep. et cetera. Yep. And then uh, commensal amoebae, entamoeba dispar, entamoeba is, coli. Yeah, we've talked about dispar before because it looks exactly like entamoeba histolytica, but it doesn't cause any pathology. So those are some yeah. examples of what he's asking for. That's right. Are there any that uh, evolve and change? You, you mentioned the strongyloides that can switch. Yeah, well, we'll get to that. We'll get to yeah, that. Yeah, so, but the, how about evolving? In our, do we know of any that have changed? In our, probably not, right? Not within our, I mean, we've got such a small amount of evolutionary history. It's only 200,000 years that we've been a species. So I think it's it's not possible. Of course, we don't have any evidence that goes back that far anyway to go on. Yeah. So no, no petrified coprolites, as they call them. Oh, actually, now that you bring that up, <laughs> I just noticed in this chapter. Yes. Um, <laughs> It says here <laughs> that pinworm ova have been recovered from human coprolites. That's correct. As old as 10,000 years. That is correct. That's right. So they're old. Probably I'm much well, older than that, not, I'm sure. You see, that's not that old. Now, 10,000 is nothing. That you just and I are dates 10, back to years. the origins of agriculture, basically. Yeah, it's probably millions and millions of years. Well, yeah, we think so. Beyond that, I wanted to thank you for the free education that I've been getting through TWIP. As a layperson, I find it easy to follow along with your talks. The biology can be complex. There seems to be a great deal of intuition behind it as well. <laughs> That's called guesswork. <laughs> Just for your own information, I found TWIP around episode two or three through iTunes. I was looking for a new science podcast and found TWIP pretty easily. I listen to each new TWIP while walking to and from work. And I've been trying to amuse my Facebook friends with anecdotes from the podcast with mixed results. What can I say? Living here in Washington, D.C., it's wonderful to listen to a couple of guys talk humbly and rationally about things that they know and love. Keep up the great work and best of luck. Thank you. P.S. My wife and I did a week in the Florida Keys this summer, and I had a hogfish for the first time in my life. It was nice. delicious. Hogfish are great. Why is he mentioning hogfish? Well, because I mentioned that we had them down in Mexico. Really? Yeah. That was a long time ago, Dixon. So That's true. It's like another era. Tell me about it. Greg writes, I'm a student research assistant at Florida Gulf Coast University's Virology Research Lab. I am hoping to get my degree and study clinical pathology and have recently begun listening to TWIP in addition to TWIV. The question I have for both of you relates to a comment made on TWIP that persons with Crohn's disease yes. that become infected with trichinella seem to get rid of the disease. No, it wasn't trichinella. It was trichurus. 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 All right. We'll get to that. Now, are there any mammalian viruses that can infect a parasite such as, well, he says trichinella, but you right. mean when they're inside the host, and how do the mechanisms work that allow the immune system to adjust from autoimmune dysfunction such as Crohn's to fighting an intracellular parasite as the cure for that autoimmune disorder? Well, I think you're mixing Trichurus with Trichinella, to be honest. Uh, Trichurus is the target for the immune system in the gut tract, in that portion of the gut, which without that organism in a subset of people can lead to Crohn's disease. Okay, so the immune uh -huh. system mistakes the gut tract for that parasite. Um, <clears throat> How it does this switching uh, is is because there's antigenic mimicry. 
that's the the basis for this. Now Is we, that right? Because there are other mechanisms too, right? Right, but I th we we think that it's a it's an antigen that's present either secreted by the parasite or on the surface of the parasite, which we recognize and attack and okay. get rid of the parasite as a result, which when the absence of that parasite occurs by hypersanitation, which we exist in, by the way, you know, to prove that we're hypersanitized, simply go to the A&P or your favorite uh, store, supermarket, and just look at how many different kinds of bars of soaps there are for sale, right? <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> You know, hundreds sometimes. I mean, it, people make a living selling soap, whether it does any good or not. <laughs> so, um, the 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 um, sanitary disposal of human feces has revolutionized the way people behave, and it has resulted in an economic uh, situation which is quite uh, wonderful for the places that have that in place that maintain mm -hmm. it. I'm talking about mostly North America, Europe, many parts of uh, Russia. and um, But there are lots of other places, and you can see the difference when it doesn't exist and when it does exist. The rates of diseases are incredibly different. So <coughs> you take away the natural targets for the immune system by sanitation, and it reveals this subset of people that develop things like Crohn's. And there are a couple of other entities like that that... Um, are just now emerging into the literature because it's recognized that these people were not just complaining about something that uh, they were making up, they were actually suffering from something quite real. And so I, I think we're going to be touching on some of these in the coming we episodes. We right? will. We Hook, will. Hookworms, too. Yes, uh, they can be <clears throat> used to divert the autoimmune disease back to its original target. All right. Uh, the next, well, thank you, Greg. The next is from Reynard, who writes, I've been listening to TWIP since the second episode, and let me join the crowd of listeners who are similarly infected by your program <laughs> and want more of it. If I had it my way, TWIP would be a daily program. Oh, my goodness. Dixon, if they paid us, we hey. could do a daily radio show, right? <laughs> I'd have to start to go back to read the original literature then. <laughs> yeah, you could do a 15-minute daily show. You know. <laughs> we could do something, that's true. Your conversational style is didactic yet natural, and I wish that many more scientists would follow your lead in their respective fields. What used to be a science of passing interest to me is now a source of frequent awe. I hope to return to university soon to study microbiology, and TWIP helped to make that an easy choice. I oh, thank well. you both for the time and effort to bring this show together. Keep up the great work. It's our pleasure. I think in every field you could find a de pommier and a rack and yellow to do this, right? Absolutely. It, not every scientist obviously has to do it. It's not necessary. No, but a lot of us would like to do it if we had the opportunity. For example, I would like a similar program in physics where two people right. sat around bantering about you know, physics. Wouldn't Vince, you love it? <laughs> I would love that. I would love that. Or just uh, planetary geology. Yeah, many, many fields. And sure, just sure. make it accessible. That's right. Or genetics. Human genetics. I would like some simple explanations for all of this very, very sophisticated genetic analysis that's going on now. A lot of the terminology has escaped uh, the common language uh, usage uh, area. And developed into snips and snurps and all kinds of other things which people have to use because they don't want to say the whole words. Mm -hmm. There are other ways of expressing that which makes everybody uh, capable of joining in on the conversation, which is, I think, the essence for finding common ground from your science to people's language and their interest. Because the moment you start speaking their language, but you're doing it in scientifically correct English... They want to join in the conversation. Sure. They'd like to say, oh, my goodness, I know several mm -hmm. examples of this and that and the other. So, but, but too often, scientists get uh, so enamored with their own abbreviated language. Okay? Yeah, so of course, of course. That they exclude everybody from the conversation except their colleague that they hate because they're in competition with them at NIH for the grant money. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think we're, <coughs> we're, do, we're doing an experiment, really. Yeah. And we hope that enough people find out and that someone in physics would listen and someone would tell them, hey, have you heard this twip? Right. And they'll listen and go, oh, I could do that. We hope it would spread virally like that. Sure. And get everyone 
in other fields. To sure, and, and by the way, that that's the reason why very often when we talk in these uh, general terms, but try to explain something that's perhaps more complicated that would require the use of a higher level of scientific uh, prose, that we often uh, omit some fact that the guy out there or the woman out there was an expert on. So we get emails from those people too telling us where we went wrong. I would very much like to try to put their comments back into a common language framework so that we could explain to the general public why we didn't bother going into those fine details because frankly I don't want to speak to the other person that can understand all these abbreviated no, terms. No, no, no. We want to speak to the person who doesn't know anything about this sure. and bring it up to a certain level. Beyond that you can go read the books. So I think that's the that's the virtue of doing this is that you you're going to get a large number of people that never thought that this could ever be interesting to suddenly it. take it. big yes. interest in it. Yes. And that's what we're hearing again and again in our email. People saying, "I never knew this stuff was so fascinating." Well, it's always been fascinating. It's not our fault that it's fascinating, but we didn't have good teachers if any, right? Well, or just people that are not willing to meet you halfway with this. You know, I I can say, "I know you're not a scientist." Mm -hmm. But I can make you understand what I what I get out of this because I have a passion for it that goes beyond that. The other problem is that most people have encountered this in a college lecture, yeah, 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 which yeah. is not always the best way. <laughs> That's true. Let's just admit it. Not everyone's a great lecturer. No, you're right. You're right. And just two people sitting around or three people sitting around jawing about something is just more appealing. Yeah. So we, uh, I, oh, I think right. we're able to, to do it in a way that teaches people, and, and it's just a nat sure. better way to learn, I think. I mean, one of the biggest disappointments of my personal life was to have encountered all the world's great literature when I was a high school student, and I was forced to read it. And I say forced, I mean we were, it was crammed down our throats. You know, we had Wordsworth and Wadsworth and Wadesworth and <laughs> every kind of poet you can think of, and then we had all the great literature, and, and we were just... It was not an enjoyable experience. Yeah, yeah. And no, the moment you as an adult pick that same book up and start reading, wow, this is fascinating. I know. I'd love to retake a lot of those courses now. Oh, no, no. Just go back and read the books, Vince. You don't have to do that. You just have to sit down Some, and read the books. Many professors have great insight. That's right? true. And it would be interesting to hear that. I watch my son now, my older son, memorizing compounds in chemistry. Yeah. Now, you you do have to memorize to a certain extent to have a... A, a body of information, but That's true. they haven't put it, brought it home. There's no effort to say here's to unify in, it in your you everyday why. life. Yeah, here, yeah, here where, right. where we encounter these, you know, make it real in some way. Right. Which is what I would do if we were doing TWIC this week in chemistry. <laughs> uh, the next email is from Amy. Hi, doctors. This break is too long. I miss you guys. <laughs> Keep up the great episodes. I love TWIV and TWIP. Very interesting, very well presented. You're the best podcast I have ever had the pleasure to listen and learn to. Thanks again for all the work you do, getting the info to the public. I'm so glad to hear that you really enjoy putting together these podcasts. Thanks for feeding my brain. <laughs> so you're fan and California vermiculturist. Ah, what do you a, think that is? A.K.A. microbe farmer. Is that right? A vermiculturist would be someone that raises earthworms. Is that right? Yeah. For what purpose? Lots Fish. of different purposes. Fishing? Well, I'll give you one example. I mean, there's a there's a guy by the name of Will Allen. He's in um, Milwaukee. Mm -hmm. He's a former uh, professional basketball player. He played in Europe as a professional basketball player. Came back to this country, made some money, decided to, let's see, what will I decide to do? Uh, maybe I will open a farm. So in Milwaukee, you have fresh water, a glore, of course. So he sets up this uh, aquaculture unit to raise yellow perch, which are delicious, by the way. And he collects restaurant waste as his composting material. And he inoculates it with some worms that he buys from some vermiculturist. Mm -hmm. And the worms go to town on this restaurant waste and reduce it down into soil. Then he takes the soil and the worm castings, which is worm poo, but actually is a great fertilizer for the plants. And he starts to connect the aquaculture with the composting with the plant raising. And the next thing you know, he's got a very large operation where he's feeding people and having a great time at doing this. Mm. He's about, Vince, he's about to make a five-story version of this. He will be the world's first vertical farmer. Low-tech. 
Does he know still, about you? Sure. I know his daughter very well. Huh. It's great. It's wonderful. So the vermiculture part of this is what do you do with all this restaurant waste? I think we've actually mentioned yeah, sure, this in the sure. past. In yeah. New York City, we feed it to the cockroaches, which then forms the food base for the rats. <laughs> no, but then we ship it off somewhere, right? Or we ship it off someplace. We do some burning now, though. A little bit, not much. Hmm. I think we should put it to better use than that. If hey. we could incinerate it, we could at least get the energy back and starve out all those poor cockroaches, mm. which then would starve out those poor rats. Yeah, the part we do incinerate is not for energy. It's just to burn it. That's exactly you know, they have these right. these high-temperature high incinerators. and Pyrolysis. Just put yeah. through pyrolysis and get it over with. This next one's from Sophie. Okay. Dear Twiv and Twip hosts, as usual, I can't keep to one subject. So she had actually sent a <laughs> Twiv question in the same email. But here, this is, I have a couple of questions and some answers for Twip Leishmania. Uh-huh. First of all, Dick said that there was new and old world Leishmania, but as I heard it, the outbreak in the U.S. was imported from Europe. So Correct. is the Leishmania Correct. in the U.S. of the old world strain? Yeah. It is. Yes, it is. By the way, dogs with Leishmania only get treated if they're symptomatic, as the medicine is quite hard on them. It is, but not treating them, of course, would allow them to serve as... Uh, Vectors. Or, well, not the vector in this case, because the vector is the sand fly, but as the reservoir for the infection. Sorry, reservoir. It's okay. It's okay. It's Why a do common. they call it a sand fly again? Uh, well, in the Middle East, of course, it lives out in, in the, the desert sand. next to animal burrows. Okay. So it's a sand fly. And in the, in the uh, new world, what's the vector? Well, they're different. In the old world, it's a phlebotomist. Phlebotomist. In, in the new world, it's lutzamaya. And they're both sand flies. They are. Thank you. During continental drift, I believe that's when they began to speciate. <laughs> There's something I don't really understand. It might just be me, but wouldn't it be better to have mosquitoes that... Okay, so this has to do with genetically modified mosquitoes. Mosquitoes that vaccinate you against one thing and can still transmit the other than having wild type that doesn't do us any good. Wouldn't there be roughly the same amount of mosquitoes no matter what? So let me refresh you. We talked about immunizing people with mosquitoes. Correct. So putting the antigens in mosquitoes and releasing them. And you mentioned, well, there's still going to be a vector for other diseases, so that's no good. And she's saying, well, isn't it good at least you're getting immunized against something? Oh, no, and she's perfectly right, it was, which is why they're still continuing with those studies. It's a shame that we couldn't um, work out the fact that when the mosquito takes a blood meal and inoculates whatever it's inoculating, that they die upon contact with your blood. <laughs> yeah. That would be great. That would be perfect. Absolutely perfect. Put in some lethal hemoglobin opathy into the paras into the mosquito yeah. so that it, it by the time it finishes injecting uh, its stuff and, and ingesting all your blood, it, it dies on the spot and that's the end of it. Okay. For just the genetically modified ones. Because I think people will still say that, you know, you're still spreading a vector that can transmit lots of other things besides the thing you're trying to stop. But malaria, if it's at the top of your list... It doesn't matter what else they can transmit. That's the one that you'd like to stop first. All right. We have a, uh, a letter from Jim who sent us a link to an article called, it's in Science Daily, yes. How to Still Kill a Resistant Parasite. Uh -huh. Scientists from the Institute of Tropical Medicine, Antwerp, which, Famous is, place. which is in Belgium, I think. Yep. In collaboration with others, have, were able to restore a sleeping sickness parasite's susceptibility to drugs. Because it has become resistant to all available drugs, it causes enormous economic losses. Trypanosoma congolense. Do you know this one? I do. So they have, um, it's a big problem, they say here. Let's see what they did. Hmm. Oxytetracycline. <laughs> yes. Enrofloxacine. Let me, let me just read this to you. For years, the Institute of Tropical Medicine collaborates with partner institutes in developing countries all over the world. Together, they search for substances that could block the drug elimination process. No easy task because the parasite does not grow in the lab, but eventually they found two substances that reinvigorated one of the old medicines. One of the old medicines is ISM, isometadmium chloride. Both substances, the new ones, are antibiotics that are affordable in poor countries. When used alone, they are ineffective, but together with ISM, huh. they are deadly. So in other words, when you use this new drug together with the old one, 
it makes them once again susceptible to the old one. So, so Jim wants to know is if this is a long-term solution. Right. Hmm. Is it? Well, T. congolensi, most people don't catch that one. Uh, they usually catch T. brucei, Rhodesians, or T. brucei, Gambian. So T. congolensi is an animal parasite. Um, and I don't know how useful it was, this would be to uh, completely eliminate it from the animal population that you're worried about. Mostly domestic, uh, domesticated animals that are used for food or for uh, work. Mm-hmm. So I, I, you know, it's a hard question to answer until you actually start to look at the economics. I think. Um, it says here that um, that it infects livestock, and that's one of yeah. the major problems. That's right. That's, mm-hmm. right. that's right. So maybe you treat the livestock with the drugs, and that helps too. Yeah, I, I'm sure that meat production is reduced with T. congolensi infection, and yeah. um, you know. They probably are susceptible to other infections as a result of slowing them down. You know, uh, eventually you're going to get resistance. Every drug, you know, that's just the way nature works, isn't it, Vince? You put a boulder in front of something and it learns how to hop over it or dig under it or walk around it. And, you know, that's that's the problem with even vaccines, okay? A mutation in the right place, sure, even though it happens sure. less, rare, or less uh, frequently, can still obviate a vaccine as well as a drug. What so, is what is the answer for trypanosomes? What what can we do? One is the, the the approach that some people were recommending, at least, was to domesticate wild African animals like the elon, because it's a large animal. It uh, gives a lot of meat, and some oh. people have tried that, and it's naturally resistant to the I trypanosomiasis. Um, a lot of people didn't accept that either because they still want their, you know, European style mm. steaks delivered to their table instead. So it's a tough balance and in fact European cattle shouldn't ever be in Africa to begin with, right? Yeah. In fact Europeans yeah. well, I wouldn't say you shouldn't go there, but I mean if you try to relocate an entire ecosystem from one place to another, you're gonna get into some trouble right away, I'm sure of this, no matter which ecosystem and no matter where you're doing it. So in Africa when the Europeans first moved in to like places like Kenya and Rhodesia and South Africa. They brought their trees, their cats, their everything with them. And of course, a lot of those things got loose. Great place to look at that is the result of that is uh, Australia, which has an enormous wild pig problem. And they never had them there before uh, mm. uh, Europeans moved to, the, to that area, right? Now, it's an enormous problem in that country. So you create problems by trying to alter things in favor of what you're used to. And I think European cattle in Africa are a bad idea for several reasons. One is that they need water every day. Where are you going to find that in East Africa? It's just not available for the most part. And so as a result of that, and climate change issues, in fact, climate change issues are what allowed us to get out of Africa to begin with. And so I think we're looking at a reversal of fortune in terms of that. So now you've got people that uh, would like to develop economic models by forcing the issue, by establishing something like LRAD, for instance, which was all well-meaning and everything, but its whole premise was to invent vaccines and uh, interference technologies to allow European cattle to survive in Africa. And maybe you should just throw up your hands and say, well, you know, that's a bad idea to begin with. Why don't we um, start again and look for another economic driver that's more compatible with the uh, with the th- with the way things run in Africa? For instance, zebras. I mean, zebras are horses, uh, horse-like animals. They're equines. Um, people eat horses. Why can't we eat zebras instead of uh, beef cattle? I don't, know, I don't know if they like zebras. I don't either, but <clears throat> the point is that that's an available food source that's readily there t- for the taking. I mean, basically you could just fence off a big area and just start yeah, sure, sure, of course. selectively harvesting, but uh, you know, that's, yeah. that's, I'm thinking out of my own box at this point. I'm, I don't, I don't want to justify or not justify uh, the inclusion of, of cattle raising in Africa as a, uh, a way of defending a, a position for um, why should you waste all this money to try to prevent this disease in European cattle? Because the African animals don't have that disease. They have that infection. Sure. But they don't have that disease. So <laughs> it, it forces you into these sociological 
uh, boxes and corners. It's all, it's all related. It definitely is. <laughs> all intertwined. But that's a great question because uh, it raises all these yeah. other issues. The last one is from John. Dear doctors, candidates, and notable notables, my name is John from Rhode Island. I'm a graduate student studying business with a background in economics. However, I find science, medicine, and skepticism-related podcasts <laughs> to be the most interesting. Right. I just wanted to comment that I found the podcasts, both TWIV and TWIP, to be very interesting. And I think I first found TWIP through related podcasts from Dr. Chris Lips' Persiflager's podcast, another excellent podcaster. Congrats on the good shows. Keep them coming. And you do have non-scientifically trained listeners out there, but I suspect we're all science nerds anyway. Do you think we are? I know we are. I, I know I am. I'm, I was always a nerd. We love Proud science. of it. <laughs> we love science. Well, Dixon, that will do it for another twip. It's over? It's over. Oh, my. And you are off to the book fairs. Indeed. If uh, if you want to listen to twip, you can listen on iTunes. You can listen at the Zune Marketplace. You can, what else can you do? You can download it with Microbe World app, which is at microbeworld.org slash twip. Or you can, uh, what else can you do? You can go to microbeworld.org slash twip where we can, you can play it or you can download it. Right. Lots of ways to get your twip fix, right, Dixon? Indeed, indeed. We'd like to get your questions and comments. And, this and corrections. Corrections, anything, twip at twiv.tv. That will do it. Dixon, thank you for telling us about Enterobius vermicularis today. This, this begins our Geohelminth journey. Geohelminths. It sounds like something that tells you where to go in your car. <laughs> no, that's GPS. <laughs> that's right. GPS. Next up will be... Trichurus. Trichurus trichuria. And Ascaris lumbricoides. They probably need an episode each. It's possible. I mean, there's a lot to talk about here. And that'll get us to the end of 2010. Wow. Three, three more, two more episodes probably, right? Wow. Because we're at the end of November and then two in December. Wow. Gee, Vince, it goes quick when you're having fun. It does. Well, Dixon, thank you for doing this. And thank you Pleasure. for doing this, Vince. You have been listening to This Week in Parasitism. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another twip is parasitic. parasitic.